Thank you for the introduction. So um, I'm going to talk about SHA-1. This is a joint work with uh, Thomas Perrin. Um, well, cryptanalysis of SHA-1 is a very technical topic, and I know it's early and you're all tired after two, three days of conference. So I will only talk about the high-level aspects of this attack, and I will not go deep down to the, the bits and the bytes of the bit flips. So if you want more details, please read the paper, but the main ideas are pretty high-level anyway, so uh, I think you, you will get the, the main points. So uh, let's start from the beginning. What's a hash function? It's uh, basically a public function that will take as input an arbitrary document and gives you a, a short output that you can use as a kind of uh, identifier for, for the document. And the, the security property we want is that this fixed function should look like a random function. In particular, it should be hard to find collision or pre-images. And that's why you can really use the output as a kind of uh, fingerprint. And this is very useful in many cryptographic uh, contexts. For instance, for signature, instead of signing a big document, you first hash it, and then you compute your signature on the hash. It's also used on blockchain. I'm just putting here so that there are more people in the room. So. Um, I will mostly talk about SHA-1. This is a very important hash function because uh, it was uh, widely standardized and used uh, basically everywhere until a few years ago. It was designed in the 90s, and uh, the, the state size and the output size is 160 bits, which means you expect a security against collision attack of roughly 2 to the 80. If you look at how it's built, it follows an iterative construction. So you, uh, you have an internal state, x here, which is 160 bits. You start with some fixed value that we call the IV, and then you cut your message into blocks, m0, m1, m2, and you process them one by one. So you have this compression function that takes the message block, the current state, and gives you the next state. And now what is inside this compression function? So we have something that looks like this. It's a construction called davis Mayer, and it's based on a kind of block cipher. So you have this here is a block cipher. You take the message as the key, you encrypt your chaining value, you get a new value here, and then you add the encrypted value and the initial value, and that's your new chaining value. And I will not go deeper inside the block cipher, so this is really all you need to know about SHA-1 for this talk. So uh, in terms of cryptanalysis, you probably know that uh, SHA-1 is broken. So uh, it's actually been broken for almost 15 years. So there was some uh, really uh, uh, amazing work in 2005 by uh, Chao Yun Wang and colleagues. And they gave the first collision attack on SHA-1. This was an attack with complexity around 2 to the 69. Um, there's been a lot of follow-up work to try to uh, better understand this attack and improve it. In particular, a paper in 2010 giving a, a better uh, estimate of the complexity and some improvements. And finally, uh, about two years ago, this attack was implemented in practice and we now have real collisions. So it took a long time because 2 to the 69 is actually a very big number and it's hard to do uh, this kind of computations. So uh, what's the status today? Well, it's been broken for 15 years, so you should expect that it's not really used anymore, right? And the good thing is uh, it's actually not used anymore in uh, web browsers. Uh, they, start, they reject SHA-1 certificates since 2017, so they took a long time, but now they do. Uh, the bad news is there's more than web browsers uh, in security, and in some applications you still use SHA-1. Uh, in particular, SHA-1 certificates, you can still buy them. If you go to some uh, CA's website, you can buy a SHA-1 certificate. And uh, a lot of clients will actually accept them. So not web browsers, like I said, but if you look at uh, mail clients, for instance, the mail application in Windows 10, it's perfectly ha happy to connect to an IMAP uh, server with a TLS connection secured with a SHA-1 certificate. There's nothing wrong with this. And those servers actually exist. Uh, until a few weeks ago, if you went to this machine, this is uh, a mail server of one of the departments of the University of Darmstadt, right here, so it's not just a random machine. And this machine had a SHA-1 certificate, so it's now expired, so they replaced it, and it's uh, now a SHA-2 certificate. But uh, yeah, SHA-1 is still really used uh, for, for security applications, and besides certificates, it's also used uh, in Git, it's used in the TLS 1.2 handshake, and probably in many different other places, uh, probably in banking, uh, they al always use very old standards. So I think it still makes sense to, to look at SHA-1 and try to see uh, how badly we can break it. So that's uh, the point of this talk. So um, I said we know how to compute collisions uh, for SHA-1. So what does it mean to compute collision, and what can we do with this? So a collision is just you start from the IV, and you manage to build two different messages, C1, C2, that give you the same outputs. 
And uh, the collision attack is a very complex process. And basically, those two messages, C1, C2, they look like big blob blobs of random uh, values. So it's hard to really do something meaningful with them. And uh, you will also have probably to hide these random looking blocks somewhere in your document. So you need a document format that's nice enough to allow you to, to hide this somewhere. But in order to make exploitation uh, a bit easier, there's a very nice trick. Uh, that you can actually add a prefix before your collision and a suffix after the collision. And this is because of the iterated structure of uh, hash functions. So if you put a prefix, it just means instead of starting your attack from the real IV, you start from the state after the prefix, and basically it's the same attack. And the suffix, well, after you collide, if you put the same uh, suffix behind, you still collide. So th what this means is here, if you take message PC1S and PC2S, this is also a collision, and you can choose P and S freely. So you can use this to control uh, your message. And this is uh, very useful if you want to exploit it. Uh, the main issue is you want a collision on two messages that are meaningful. If you just have a collision on two random messages, it's hard to use. But using this prefix and suffix trick, you can do it with relatively meaningful messages. And in particular, a nice trick is that many document formats allow some kind of uh, conditional branches. And so you can build messages that look uh, like this. So I'm using pseudocode here, but this could actually be more like a PDF document. And so you start with some uh, if condition, and this will be your prefix, then you compute a collision, and then you put a message like this as suffix. And now what this does, those two messages will collide because uh, this is a collision block and you just have a common prefix and common suffix. But now when you try to view this document or to execute them if they could, they do very different things because the, the condition uh, is true in one case and false in the other. So now you have two very different documents and both of them have the same uh, hash value. And this is actually uh, what was used to build those two PDFs here. So this is uh, what we can do now uh, in terms of practical attack. So this is good when you can use those tricks in the document format, but in, in some cases you cannot use those tricks. And then the collision attack will not be powerful enough to really break a protocol. And a nice idea uh, that was introduced in 2007 is to do something a little bit more general than just a collision attack. It would be nice if you could start from two different prefixes, P1, P2, and then somehow manage to get a collision from these two different states. And this is something we call a chosen prefix collisions. And what this means is uh, a challenger is giving you P1, P2, and now you have to find two messages M1, M2, so that P1, M1, and P2, M2 give a collision. And if you know how to do this, you can break a lot more stuff. You can break certificates and you can break many uh, internet protocols. So just to give you a simple example uh, on uh, a kind of PKI infrastructure. So what is uh, a PKI? How do you certify a key? Well, the idea is quite simple. If Alice wants a certification on, of, on her key, she just generates a key. Then she makes a document like this, the public key of Alice is blah, blah. And she goes to the CA, and the CA is going to sign uh, this document. Now, how do you attack this? Well, the idea is that Bob is going to create two different documents, one that says the key of Alice is something, and the other that says the key of Bob is something. And it's going to use a chosen prefix collision attack to make those two documents collide. And here, the prefix is on one side the key of Alice, and on the other, the key of Bob. And so if you just have a collision attack, you cannot do this. But if you have a chosen prefix collision attack, then you can do this kind of collision. And now Bob can just ask for a certification of his key. And because the two collide, he can actually use this signature on the key of Alice. And now he can impersonate Alice because he has a document that says the key of Alice is something. And he controls the something. And he has uh, a certification of that. So uh, to summarize, chosen prefix collision are a more dangerous kind of collision attack. They really break stuff in practice. They've been used to create a ROG CA, and they've been used by the flame malware. So it's really uh, a, real, uh, a practical uh, threat. In terms of generic attacks, they both have the same uh, complexity, 2 to the n over 2. But in terms of cryptanalysis, chosen prefix collision attacks are much harder. And uh, currently, the best known attack on SHA-1 has complexity 2 to the 77, so it's still uh, not really usable. So the goal of this work is to reduce the gap between the complexity of the identical prefix collision, which is 2 to the 647 on SHA-1, and the chosen prefix collision. So we want to improve the chosen prefix collision attack to make them more uh, practical. 
So uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you do cryptanalysis on SHA-1 and related function. So the main idea is that you do uh, something based on differential cryptanalysis. And the idea of differential cryptanalysis is that to try to control the differences during a computation. And so if you can somehow start from a zero difference, then have some differences from the message, at some point cancel them and you go back to a zero difference, well, this directly gives you a collision attack. You just have to find a message following this trail, and uh, this is a collision. Unfortunately, it's hard to find uh, trails, in particular trails like this. But what we can do, there's a nice trick, um, using the fact that the message expansion is linear in SHA-1, we can build some trails uh, with good probabilities. I will not go through the details, it's not very important. But we know how to build some trails, but they don't start from zero and they don't go to zero. The next important trick is that in the first round here, at the beginning of the computation, you don't have to pay for uh, the probability cost because you can just choose the message that satisfies the path. So this is nice, we don't really care about the initial steps. But now what we can do is, in those initial steps, instead of using the nice trails that are uh, linearized, we can just modify them and use basically arbitrary trails, even if the probability is super bad, it doesn't matter because we don't pay this probability anyway. So we can actually start from an arbitrary difference and then connect to a good trail in the middle. And using this, you already get uh, near collisions because you can start from zero and get a small difference here. And finally, the last trick is a multi-block technique where you're going to use two blocks using the same kind of trails, and then the output difference will cancel because of the feed forward. So it actually looks uh, like this. You start from a good linearized trail here, from delta i to delta o. You repeat it two times, one the normal trail, the second time you just flip it, so you have a negative sign. And then when you go through the feed forward, uh, so you start from zero difference, you get difference delta o, and then through the feed forward they cancel out. So this is how we do collision attacks on MD5 and SHA-1. Now, how can we do uh, chosen prefix collision attacks? You're going to need a few more tricks. And uh, the main idea is that you want to define a set of differences here that are somehow uh, nice, meaning that starting from one of those differences, you know how to go to a collision. And if you can define this, then what you do is you just start after your two prefixes. So here you have some random difference in the state. And you just process random blocks until you reach uh, this nice set of differences. And this is just a birthday attack. And the complexity is about square root of 2 to the n over size of s. So if s is big enough, this is not too expensive. And then you have a phase where you use several blocks of near collision. And you, can you erase your difference because you assume that it's nice, so you know how to do it. So uh, what kind of differences are nice? Well, there have been two uh, variants of those attacks proposed so far. So on MD5, uh, what we do is we use several trails that are uh, different, so they affect different bits of the output. And therefore, you can cancel differences bit by bit. And this gives you a nice uh, structured set that you can, uh, uh, that you can define uh, easily. On SHA-1, it's quite different because we only have really uh, very few good trails. So you have to start from a single trail. And then you cannot really have a nice structured set S. But instead, what you can do is uh, give a little bit of freedom in the last rounds. So you can affect a few different uh, values. And this just defines your set S. So you have a very small set and no nice structure. And so the goal of our work is mostly to uh, get a bigger set of nice differences for SHA-1. And for this, we basically try to combine the two approaches. Because we target SHA-1, we want to use a single core trace, because we don't have many good trails. But we want to use ideas with several blocks, because this allows us to get uh, a bigger set. And that's really the, the main uh, idea here. So we introduce uh, three little tricks. And when you combine all of them, you get something relatively nice. The first trick is uh, to look inside the compression function and give more freedom at the end. The second trick is to use several blocks. And the final trick is something we call clustering. Uh, I will talk about later. But it's basically we don't fix in advance which blocks we're going to use. So let's start uh, with the first trick. So we start from some differential trail in SHA-1. And uh, like in previous work, we look at the last rounds, and we give a little bit of freedom in order to be able to reach uh, a few uh, different values of output differences. 
So in the previous attack, uh, they used a set of 192 differences. And in our work, we relax it a bit more, and we show that we can actually reach uh, more than 8,000 differences. And well, just by using this, you actually reduce the complexity of the attack from 2 to the 77 something to uh, 2 to the 74.3. So that's already uh, a nice uh, improvement. So now we, uh, the next trick is to use several blocks. So uh, <coughs> as I explained, we don't have a nice structure on uh, one block. So uh, we, we cannot really have a, a nice set S that we can describe uh, like uh, abstractly, like you need to have this and this bit to be zero. But what we can do is if, we, if we're going to use two blocks, we actually know in advance the type of values that we can cancel. Because we know that the first block will have an output which is uh, in, the set, uh, in the set that corresponds to those value here. Uh, which is denoted D here. So we know that after the first block, we are in set D. After the second block, we are in set D. And actually, when you do the feed forward, what you get is if you want to have zero at the end, it means the initial value might be the sum of two values that are in D. So you just build a set like this. And then if you want to cancel delta 1 plus delta 2, it just means in the first block, you want the output difference to be minus delta 1, in the second block, minus delta 2, and you will be able to cancel it. So. Um, you have to compute, compute explicitly this set, you don't have a nice description, but as long as you can compute it, it's e quite easy to, to just exhaustively build it, and you know that all those values are nice. So this is with two blocks, of course you can do it with more, and you can get a relatively large set if you increase the number of blocks. And using this, the complexity now goes down to, to 68.6, so now we, we're getting a, a relatively large gain. And finally, uh, the last trick is what we call uh, clustering. And the idea is, uh, now we're going to look at this in terms of a graph. So we take the set S of nice differences, those are all the uh, vertices in the graph, and the edges are the near collision block that we can use to move from one difference to another. So the, the difference between the two points is one of the value that we can reach uh, in this set D. And an important uh, observation about this type of graph is that there are uh, many paths going from a given point to zero, which corresponds to collisions. There's not a single path. So if we just do a, a naive attack, you would first select a path and then use the blocks corresponding to the path. But instead of this, we, we will try to take advantage of the fact that there are many different paths and use them at the same time. And well, there are several reasons why there are several paths, but the, the, the most basic case is you ju can just uh, change the order of the blocks. I mean, if you have two blocks, if you do delta 1, then delta 2, or delta 2, then delta 1, you get the same result. So you, you have at least this uh, amount of freedom. And so how can we uh, use this freedom? Well, if you look at how the attack is actually performed, so you, you start with a birthday phase, you get your nice difference, and then you want to cancel it. And so you're going to start with the first block, so you know you have to target some difference delta 1. And now what you do, you start from delta 1, you look at your uh, collision attack, this gives you some uh, message condition, how to reach delta 1, and then you try many random messages until you hit delta 1. But actually in many cases you can have several differences that are useful for you and that have the same message conditions. And what this means is you're going to choose several uh, interesting target delta, if they all have the same message condition, you can find a message for any of them simultaneously. And if you have, for instance, two possibilities for the target, then it's twice as easy to reach one of them. And then the cost of each block uh, becomes uh, much smaller. And that's really the, the trick that we use here. So um, if you want to really do it properly, uh, it's a little bit uh, tricky because you have to look at, well, uh, all the blocks don't have the same cost. And some of them are farther from collision than others, so you have to be a little bit careful. But in the end, you can actually compute uh, the, the complexity of each uh, target difference, and you can decide uh, what message condition you, you should use at each step and how to, to move around in this, in this graph. And in the end, the complexity is reduced to uh, roughly uh, 2 to the 67. So those are, are all the tricks we use uh, at a high level. Now, if you want to go more to a lower level, so it's going to be a little bit ugly. Uh, I will not go through the details, but the, the big idea is we just start from the shattered collision attack, because this attack was implemented in practice, so we know it actually works, which is not necessarily the case of all proposed attack on SHA-1. And we know the complexity of this attack. 
And now, uh, in our case, we need a little bit more freedom at the bottom and at the top. So maybe it's a little bit more expensive to find a block than in the shattered attack. So if you're optimistic, you can assume it's the same cost. If you're more pessimistic or conservative, you can add some uh, safety margin. And uh, this is just how we will estimate the cost of the attack. So now you just have to build the set and the graph. Uh, it's actually uh, a significant effort because uh, the set has about two to the 34 nodes, so that's a big set, and then you have to do when well, there are many edges and you have to do the clustering, so it takes a bit of time. But in the end, you can perform this computation, and then you have uh, some uh, trade off that you can do. You can either use a, a smaller set of uh, differences with a small cost, and this means your birthday will be more expensive because you have fewer values to target, but then the second phase will be cheaper because you only keep the easiest value. Or you use a bigger set, and then the birthday is cheaper. And depending on your assumption on the cost of one block, you have to select different trade-offs. And then the complexity, if you're optimistic, we estimate it will be uh, 2 to the 66.9. And with a more conservative estimate, we get 69.4. So uh, to conclude, what we do in this work is basically propose a framework that we can use to turn a collision attack into a chosen prefix collision attack, so a more powerful kind of attack. And this is quite generic, and we don't really need special property of the, the initial collision attack. And we've applied this to SHA-1, and so we get uh, a pretty significant improvement from 2 to the 77.1 to something around 2 to the 67. And we've also applied it to MD5, and we get some results in some specific case if you limit the number of blocks to just two blocks. So uh, what we show is that the gap between collision attack and chosen prefix collision attack is not so big. In the case of SHA-1, it's between 5 and 25, so it's not uh, a huge gap and much smaller than what was thought before. Um, so uh, since this paper was published, we've, we've been still working on this, of course, but we've been looking more at the low-level details, and we now have a better estimate of the complexity. So here I was saying uh, this range. And as far as we understand now, it will be around 2 to the 67.2. And we can estimate the cost uh, to run this attack. A nice way to estimate the cost is just to look how expensive it is to rent a GPU to run the attack. And if you want to do this on uh, the Amazon cloud, it will cost about $2.6 million. So that's uh, a large amount of money, but it's also something that is probably feasible. But actually, you can get GPUs much cheaper than that. And the reason is, um, apparently, some people bought lots of GPUs to mine cryptocurrencies some time ago. But now it's not so profitable anymore. So they're renting those GPUs uh, relatively cheaply. So uh, if you go to those kind of GPUs instead of the Amazon one, you could actually run the attack for around $500,000. So that's still a large amount of money, but it's definitely reachable by a state-level uh, adversary. So this attack can be run in practice. So clearly, if you're still using sha please stop right now. And uh, just to conclude on some ongoing work, so uh, unpublished at the moment, we have new ideas to improve this a little bit more. And uh, we think we can actually get the cost below $100,000. So that's now uh, really reachable, even for academics. And so we're now working on implementing this attack. And uh, we hope we will uh, get a real chosen prefix collision by the end of the year. But well, of course, we never know what kind of issues can come in the way. And uh, that will conclude my talk. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Oh, that's for the birthday you, phase. Okay, Tom, can you repeat the question? Okay. So, um, Serge was asking in the birthday phase how we reach... Uh, where was it written? Here, yeah. You're asking about this to, to the n over square root of s, right? So, um, yeah, in... Uh, <coughs> So the idea, so you start from two different uh, states with some random differences. And from each of those states, you hash a number of random blocks from uh, state one and from state two. And you look at all the possible pairs, and you check if one of the pairs is in the set S. So that's the basic idea. Now, in terms of implementation, of course, you don't want to store everything. So you need to use a memoryless algorithm. So there are some technical details. But the basic idea is, is just a birthday search and the Yeah. 
No, we look at pairs from this side. I mean, um, the complexity is the number of random blocks we have to try here. Until one of the pairs of random block, the difference is in the set S. Does it? Okay, yeah. Also, the complexities you described, except uh, this one, are concrete numbers yeah. rather than formulas. So, uh, in your three basic tricks, you use mostly the field forward. Um, so, can you estimate for a general uh, hash function? Uh, what will be the saving uh, if based on the fact that if you can uh, find an effect without the chosen prefix, yeah. this complexity, then how much are you going to save? Is there any general problem or any possibility? No, not really. You really have to look at the details. Uh, it, it also depends... Example, how big are the clusters? Can you get any estimate? This really depends on the hash function. It depends on how you build your differential trace and what are the, co the conditions. Also, I think one big factor is uh, how far your initial collision attack is from the generic one. So in SHA-1, the gap is not too big, so that's also why we don't lose too much going to chosen prefix. In MD5, uh, the gap is much bigger. Uh, I think I have numbers here. Yeah, the, the best uh, collision attack is only 2 to the 16, so there's a big gap with a generic attack, and so we there we lose a lot when we go to chosen prefix collisions. But in general, no, there's no, no formula, no. <laughs> yeah? In your proof estimation, you seem to assume that it's uh, trivial to find out if a pair is in the set. Is this really so instantly structured? So it's not it's trivial. Can you repeat the question? Oh, OK, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the question is, um, uh, when we do this uh, birthday uh, stage, we need to detect whether the difference here is in the set or not. And the question was, how easy is this? So in general, yeah, it could be hard. In the case of SHA-1, it's not too hard because uh, those values are built basically yeah, like this. There are sums of values that are all in some core uh, set. And so this means uh, s basically some bits will never be affected or with very low probability. So we just look for collisions on some specific bits and then we test the full difference if it's in the set or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we need some extra tricks, absolutely. <laughs> yes? Could you clarify the difference between theoretical and practical or something that was implemented in one and was not? Is there just a threshold of cost below which it is practical and below which it is theoretical? Okay, so the question is, uh, what do we mean by theoretical and practical? And uh, so, yeah, in, in this work, it's just implemented or not implemented. When I was uh, talking about it, uh, when I'm listing attacks on SHA-1, here, yes. So I'm saying the first attacks are theoretical in the sense they were not implemented. And then uh, in 2017, the attack was finally implemented. So there's no fixed threshold. It depends on how much you're willing to spend to uh, implement this attack. So here, what I'm presenting here, the attack with complexity to, to the uh, 67, I think it's almost practical in the sense you could run it if you really uh, have money to, to spend, but we didn't run it because we don't have this uh, $500,000. So yeah, there's no clear threshold between practical and theoretical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so if there are no further questions, you <coughs> so if there are no further questions, then let's thank Tom again. Thank you.